We are about to begin the Veterans History Project interview. My name is Anthony Karina. I am the genealogy coordinator of the Schaumburg Township District Library in Schaumburg, Illinois. I will be interviewing William Herod, U.S. Army, regarding his military service. Today's date is January the 22nd, 2019. The, student, the interview is being conducted in the Schaumburg Township District Library TV studio. Bill, thank you for participating in the Veterans History Project. Thank you for your military service, and it is a privilege and an honor to conduct this interview with you. Thank you. So let's start somewhat at the beginning. Give us a little bit of background. Where were you born? I was born in Chicago, Illinois, an inner city kid. Ah, and what year? 1948. And how about your mom and dad? What are their names? <clears throat> my mother's name was Violet, and my dad's name was Bill William Fred Herod. Okay. Uh, he worked as a, uh, in a steel manufacturing company, and my mother was a homemaker. And did you have brothers and sisters? I had a sister and a half-brother, or a uh, step-brother. Okay, and what are their names? Uh, John, and my sister's name was Susan. Okay. And school-wise, where did you go to grammar school, mm -hmm. high school? Yeah, I went northwest side. I went to Nixon Grammar School, and then I went to Kelvin Park High School. <clears throat> After high school, I went to, to junior college. Okay. And what area is that? Because I also am from the Chicago area. So what would you call that area where you grew up in? Northwest side of Chicago. Okay. All right. And uh, so now you went to what college did you go to, you said? Went to Wilbur Wright Junior College. It was okay. called Community College now, but back then, Wilbur Wright Junior College. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and were you able to finish your, your degree program there? Yeah, I finished two years of associate's degree, and the day I graduated, I got my letter from the U.S. Army uh, congratulating me, and, and I'm now drafted. Wow. The day talk, I graduated. Talk about timing, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Had, had you been, let's say, even while you were going to, to Wilbur Wright College and stuff like that, had you been employed? Were you having a job, or were you, were you a full-time student? No, I worked full-time. I was a full-time student. I worked oh. full-time in national supermarkets. Okay. So. Well, that's good to know. So now you got your letter from Uncle Sam that you were drafted in, and what was the process? How did that, what were the next steps you had to do? Well, they gave you so many days to go down. <clears throat> My dad took me downtown to the induction center. And we shook hands, and uh, I went in there, and you were inducted down there, given some tests, uh, given a physical, and uh, with a whole bunch of other kids, some kids from the Northwest Side. So. Okay. Did you have friends, or did you know of other people that were in the same induction process? I had one friend who was in the same induction process, but the other kids were from Schurz High School and other high schools in the Northwest Side. They were okay. drafted also. Okay. Wow, that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty good to a bunch of people. At least you had some friendly faces or friendly right. people from the neighborhoods and stuff like Correct. that. Correct. Were they drafted like you? you Everyone know? was drafted. Everyone. That I was with, yes, sir. Okay. So what was the next steps when you got, I guess, sworn in? And mm -hmm. then what happened after that? Then they put you on buses, and then they take you over to... Uh, Fort Leonard, Missouri, which was basic training. Everything was done by buses, okay. uh, no, no airplanes. Bus to, to Fort Leonard for basic training, and then a bus after that down south to Fort Polk, Louisiana for okay. advanced infantry training. Now, what was the interval of training at Fort Leonard Wood? That was basic training, introduction into the military, uh, basic uh, how to shoot a rifle, uh, how to march, how and to how take orders. how long did that take for you to go I think it was about, I think it was about eight weeks, something like that. Okay. And it was more or less indoctrinated into the military, following orders and doing what they wanted to do. And there was one thing they kept on saying, hurry up, hurry up. And it was hurry up and wait. I hated that, but it was hurry up and wait wherever you went. And so after that was done, that first introductory training part, you said you went to Fort Polk? Yeah, you went home for two weeks and then went down to Fort Polk, Louisiana for advanced infantry training. There they gave you detailed training on different kind of weapons, uh, what the... Uh, Southeast Asia was going to be like because Fort Polk, Louisiana was in a hot, warm, wet climate, okay. almost like Vietnam. So they inducted you into, into doing that. Was it during this process that you had any choices that you were allowed to make on your own direction to go into, or was everybody pretty much assigned the same? Everybody was more or less assigned the same thing. I thought that since I had a degree from Wright Junior College that I would be off of some material, but no, you were number. And uh, it was just like, a group of people came and a group of people left. That's okay. how it was. And so how, so that, how long was the process at Fort Polk? Another eight I, weeks I thought another or eight so? weeks, yeah. And then there you learned how to uh, <clears throat> shoot a 45, an M14 rifle, an M16 rifle, 
M79 grenade launcher, learn how to throw grenades, how to shoot a light anti-take weapon, any kind of weapon that you would need when you're in Vietnam, they trained you with. Wow. And you how had to qualify. How about the training of like tactics or something, or was that left to the officers? No, they, they, had, they had training on hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, training on how to fight with a, with a uh, no weapon, with uh, just a rifle against somebody else when you have no, no uh, more bullets left and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and they had us use, I'll never forget this, we had to use pugil sticks. They were long sticks with foam at both ends. Okay. And then uh, everybody was in a big circle, and one guy had to go out there, and then he would call another and go out there, and you'd have to beat the heck out of each other. Uh, All you had was a helmet on with a face mask. Okay. And uh, you had a, the first guy on the ground, he leaves, then another guy takes his place. So it's like, you know, that, and then, well, this is what you're going to do in case you don't have any bullets, and you have a, and your rifle, and you've got to fight with the rifle. A little strange, but that's what it was. Did, did you have, like, during either the beginning part of training at Fort Leonard Wood or Fort Polk, um, did you have, like, any discoveries of, of, of something about yourself that was like, wow, I didn't realize this was as bad, or I didn't realize I could be as good as I was at this? Well, all the exercises and the running was no problem to me because I was, I was an athlete. Uh, but uh, all these weapons were all brand new to me, and I felt like saying, I'm going to shoot this, I'm going to really going to shoot it at somebody, I'm going to kill somebody, I'm not going to go hunting, but this is going to be somebody, and they're going to be shooting back at me. That was the biggest transition for me, to thinking that this is for real, you know, and these weapons are real, and uh, these are, you know, they'll go, the bullets go right through you, they'll kill you, and what have you. So it's not like you shoot and you fall down dead like in the movies, and you get up and say goodbye, no. It's like, these things are real, and they're very, very potent. Were you getting a sense at that time of what the next step was going to be, you know, and when you were going to be sent over? Well, we kind of got the idea that if you went to advanced infantry training school, they weren't going to send you to Germany. Okay. Everybody wanted to go to Germany and what have you. But when you go to Fort Polk and you're trained for that, similar tactics, similar climate as Vietnam, mm -hmm. we knew where mm -hmm. most of us were going to go to Vietnam. And, and let's say you're, the training part was done, were you allowed to get back home before they shipped you out? Uh, I think for, uh, uh, I don't know, a week or two, yeah, and then they, then they shipped you out from there. Well, actually, my dad took me to uh, Midway, I got on a plane, went to Seattle, Washington, and Seattle, Washington, you, you, you get all the other uh, military people, and then you take planes over to Vietnam. Okay. So what did your parents think of you when you came back that time just before being sent overseas? Well, they were, my dad was a little... Uh, apprehensive because he was a chief in the Navy and he thought I should have went in the Navy. But everybody in my neighborhood went to high school, graduated, went in the Navy, four years came back and got married. Okay. I graduated from high school and I went to junior college. Yeah. So I didn't like everybody else. <clears throat> and then I was going to work for a, a, a year to get some money so I can go to the University of Illinois. Okay. But uh, they got me before I had a chance to do that. So, but, but my mom was a little scared. But nobody on the block at that time uh, was in Vietnam. When I was in there, three more of the people on my block were in Vietnam, and then uh, that's when the, that's when the reality hit. You know, her, my mom and dad. Did Did you feel that the training that you had and all the physical activity that had bulked you up, beefed you up? Did you feel I'm, different yourself? I was still a skinny kid, but they they. Uh, and I don't brainwash you, but they, they say it would be the best you can be and stuff like that. And those guys are small, and we're big, and we're bigger and stronger, and we have more things behind us like the Air Force and the Navy, and that uh, all those people are going to be behind you, that it should be no problem. Okay. You know? So now, did you actually get orders to now that you had to meet someplace, come nope. back from your visit from Chicago, and well, now? We, we got the orders when we left advanced, when we left Fort Polk, we got orders. They say, go home. And the scariest thing that I knew something was up was when the drill sergeant said, go home, make peace with your maker, and then report for duty over in Seattle, Washington. Wow. Those and are he, was, some... he was an infantry guy from Vietnam. So okay. he, I, I know he was looking at all of us, and I can't help but think that he was saying, some of you are going to make it, some of you aren't. That's why he said, make peace with your maker. And what year, I, I think I asked you, what year was this that you were actually drafted then? 1969. Okay. And I think from even just recollections of what I understand about that time period, that was sort of the busiest, heaviest parts of our involvement there, I think. Well, it was, yeah, yeah, it was pretty busy, but also at that time there was a lot of like negative press coverage and stuff like that. This didn't have in the beginning, but yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so now when you had to do your reporting to get shipped out, were you, every, was everybody who had the orders 
you all met up at some some central place, and then you all went out together at the same yeah, time? Yeah, we all took planes from all different places, met in Seattle at the airport, okay. and there were buses waiting for us there to take us to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And we, were, we stayed there, they checked everything out, and then I think uh, a day later, they, we went on a, on a plane, Flying Tiger Airlines, never forget that, Flying Tiger Airlines from Seattle, Washington, and it flew over to Japan, then to Alaska, then to Vietnam. Okay. Did you have any problems getting over there you know, with the trip itself? or was, It must have been a long trip. It was a long trip, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that bad. Okay. So now you arrive in Vietnam. Um, what's your first gut feelings when you disembarked off the plane? Well, Flying Tiger Airlines flew into Cameron Bay. So uh, <clears throat> we would get off the plane and we'd be walking over to these, these, these buses to take us where we're going to go. And there'd be a line of other guys facing the other direction, yeah. going to go on the plane. Okay. So we'll, I'm, I'm a little kid. I'm like five foot, you know, five foot eight, 150 pounds, and I'm looking at these other guys. They look bigger and stronger, and they look tougher than I am. And uh, I'm kind of scratching my head, you know. I hope I'm as good as these guys here because these guys made it. But mm -hmm. uh, they're looking at us, you know, kind of judging us, what have you. And then we went in the bus and we drove to Cameron Bay to a big compound, and there we waited for uh, almost a week to get our name called. When our name was called, then they gave us, they, they flew us to where we were going to be in Vietnam. <clears throat> so Cameron Bay was like a staging area where cool. all the new, rec all of the new uh, draftees, recruits were coming in to replace others in other parts of Vietnam and stuff like that. Correct. So you waited for a week. Um, how was it acclimating to what it was in Vietnam? Did it seem like the Fort Polk experience really did prepare you? Yeah, it, it more or less did. Uh, during that time, we had pulled guard duty on all the bunkers around Cameron Bay. <clears throat> At nighttime, daytime, we'd have to sit in there and then we'd wait for our name to be called. Uh, also, they gave us some kind of training where they would bring like 30 of us in this area and they would be uh, barbed wire all over there. And they told us, this is the enemy. They brought a Vietnamese guy, this is the enemy. And he's called a sapper, S-A-P-P-E-R. Okay. And they showed how he would start in the back of the barbed wire and crawl through the barbed wire and then right up to the front. They wanted to show us that this is how ingenious these little guys are. What okay. they do. And usually a sapper who does something like that has explosives. Okay. So they wanted to impress upon us that even though we are the best and the brightest and all the stuff like that, these people can sneak through the barbed wire with explosives and can do a lot of damage. That was part of our education before okay. going out in the field. Um, was, was waiting a week about the, maybe the average that everybody waited for, or were there people <coughs> that waited longer to get well, called I, up? I, I waited a week and I didn't see anybody else that I knew okay. that came in with me. So they came in and went So it's a pretty, pretty quick turnaround then. Correct. And so once, what was the process of how you got notified to go report to your ultimate location? Well, we were all gathered in the morning and they called the names out and we'd have to go to a certain location. And from there we'd be in a helicopter and they would send us over to where we were designated. We went, we were, we, we replenished men in the field who were either <clears throat> on the way going home or there's been uh, some contact and they were short people, whether okay. people were uh, killed or, or uh, wounded or what have you, they had to be replenished, and that's what they did with us. Okay. And again, as the training that you got for infantry, it, it fit their needs, and they weren't looking for other kind of specialists or anything like that. No, they were just, uh, they were, we were all private first class, all qualified on M16 rifles and things like that, so they just plugged in where they needed them. Okay. So what was it like actually reporting to your first location then? Well, <clears throat> I thought we'd have to go out in the field and we'd be with a hundred other guys. No, they actually flew us over to uh, Duckfold, Duckfold, and from Duckfold they took us a truck. And uh, we went to a village called uh, Van Tron. Okay. And uh, at that time, we didn't know what it was, but that was part of the, the pacification program. We didn't go out in the field and hump or walk the fields three, you know, th 30 days out of the month. We went into a village where uh, that was our base of operation, a, a, a Vietnamese village. Okay. And uh, they, entered, they told us about the pacification program. You are now in that, and this is what you're going to do, and this is how you're going to do it. And was that sort of like a new technique, tactic that we were doing yeah. to start the pacification program? Right. They thing called Vietnamization where the Army and the Air Force worked with the Vietnamese uh, Army and what have you. But in the pacification program, what they did is they corralled all the people 
into one particular area, secured it with barbed wire, and uh, the GIs, or the, we, we lived in the village with the people. Okay. Uh, we lived in part of their house, and they lived in the other part of the house. The people could work the fields during the day and come back to the village at nighttime. Nothing was stolen like the Via Cong before this was all instituted. The Via Cong would raid the village at nighttime, take all the food they needed, or take their sons or daughters to make them Via Cong and stuff like that. So the army said, we're going to pacify them, okay. we're going to protect them, and we're going to uh, be their friends. And the people that are in the village, which were villagers and also PFs and RFs. PFs are popular forces and RFs are regional forces. They're not Army Republic of Vietnam, they're, they're local local and then we would train them on our missions working out of that village. Okay. And what, what part of the country of Vietnam is the village that you were in located in? North, central, south? Well, uh, Vietnam was, was cut into the three, four different areas. One, two, three, and four. One being the northernmost area near the demilitarized zone. And that's where my, my, uh, okay. my section was. Saigon was in uh, the, uh, the, the third, I think, the third part down, way down south. Never saw Saigon, and uh, so I don't know how that is, but. Uh, okay. Well, was the Army, through the pacification program, doing it for more villages around the one that you were in, or were you guys sort of like a standalone trial that they were doing this? Well, we were in Bravo Company, and Bravo Company <clears throat> had uh, one platoon was in the village that I was in. A platoon was like 30 guys. And also the mortar platoon was in there, which is like 15, 20 guys and also the captain of the, the company was there. Further down the road, there was a city called Moduck. There was another platoon down at Moduck, okay. and that was run by lieutenants. And then there's also another area called the bridge, which another platoon secured that with PFs and RFs, what have you. There was no lieutenant down there. But uh, each, the, the two villages, uh, we were the heart of the pacification program. And to my knowledge, I wasn't aware that anybody else in Vietnam did that. There's a book called A Distant Challenge, and the chapter is written called Pacification Duck Fo by the captain who I had, Captain Boyd Harris. Okay. And uh, he wrote all about it and explained everything. And more or less said, corral everybody together, let the people work, we protect them, we teach them how to fight, so when we're, when we're ready to go, they can be self-sufficient. What was the total size of the um unit that was in ductile for you at this time? I mean, was it hundreds of, of soldiers? Uh, there were like 30 soldiers in our village, okay, and there were 30 up in Moduck, oh, and okay. I think there may be 20 at the bridge. Okay, so it's not a huge force. No, no. What was an average day like for you out no. there? Out there, we had three things to, we just did over and over and over again. There were three platoons in, in, in my village, which is Van Trung Village. One would stay in the village during the day, one would patrol in the vicinity during the day, and one would have ambushes at nighttime. Oh, wow. That rotated every, every, every day, it was something different, but those are the three things that happened every day. Stayed and secured the village, day patrol, and then night ambush. So 30 people are responsible for doing all these three functions, then it sounds like it. Well, different squads, different squads would do that, you know. Uh, like my squad of like five guys, there's supposed to be 12 guys in a squad, but okay. in reality only, we only had five in Vietnam. Okay. But when we went out on patrols, we went out with the RFs or the PFs, and we showed them how to do this and how to do that, how to throw a grenade, how to shoot, and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, so that's, that's, and you had, uh, uh, let's see, you had over here, you had, yeah, you had, the, yeah, yeah, you had about 30 people. So when uh, each one, you know, some guys stayed home. Some guys were on sick call, what have you, couldn't go out because they either had, they had problems, what have you. And uh, so that's, that's how it worked. How far when you went out on patrol? What, how far of a distance did you go from the village? Well, they called it clicks, but it was probably like the most we had, like three to four miles, what have you. And then you would go out there and you would come back. But you go different ways out and different ways back. And were, were, you, were there a lot of like helicopter support in this too? Because I know that there, there's a, a whole process of warfare that we were using with helicopters. Yeah. That was mainly used by the companies that, that, that they called the grunts that walked all the time. We stayed out of the village. We didn't use helicopters. The only time we called in helicopters <clears throat> was when we needed gunships to help, to help us, what have you. Okay. Uh, so we very rarely did we ever get helicopters come to get us. Okay. Sometimes we did when the village down the way Moduck got, got uh, overrun, they came and took us, got helicopters because we had to get down there quick. They, they, they took all of us and 
dropped us over in Mo Duck to help them out. Okay. But most of the time, it was you walked everywhere you went in, in, this, in this program. Okay, wow, that's, I mean, that's a, I mean, and again, the heat, I'm sure you're going to tell me that it was sort of like a lot of heat out there and humidity. Yeah, when I went there, it was in uh, November, and the, uh, it was during the rainy season, and it rained 24-7 for like four or five weeks, and everything was mud, and uh, if you had any kind of like a sore, it, you got ringworm, they called it okay. the dink sore, and uh, you're always carrying extra dry socks, things like that. But it was, uh, <coughs> and then after that it was hot, very, very hot. Even though we would do patrols in, in jungle, and it was called triple canopy jungle, there were so many layers that it was called triple canopy. Even that, it was still hot because it was still moist, you know. Okay. The, whole, the whole countryside was, uh, was wet and hot, or wet and cold in the uh, monsoons. What was it like going out on your first patrol? A little scary, uh, but we, I hadn't hit any contact yet, so you're still full of, you know, right. gung-ho stuff like that they teach in, in advanced infantry training. But the thing that, that, that uh, we had to cross a river, and uh, when we crossed the river, we had to hold our rifles above our heads and things like that, and then everybody got on the other side of the river, and everybody starts taking out uh, insect repellent. And I said, what are you guys doing? And he said, look at your neck, and leeches. I hate mm. leeches. They clung to everything. Your neck, all of you couldn't feel them. But when you go through the, the when you cross a river, those leeches would cling to you like that. And you take uh, insect repellent and they come right off. Or some guys who smoke would touch them with a cigarette and they'd come off. Or you take a packet of salt and throw salt on them and they'd come right off. Wow. So that was my you, first patrol. When you went out on patrol, what, what was the time period that you were out of the village then for? Yeah, it's probably around four to five hours. You leave at, uh, and you're on radio contact all the time, so you have to, everywhere you go, every 15, every 30 minutes, you have to say what's your situation, your, sit with, your situation report, you have to tell them where you are and what you're doing, okay. if you have contact or what you see. Wow. So let's say you, you were, it was a, a successful patrol or something like that. You guys would just come back to the village then, and then maybe the night operation would then start, but it would be with another group of... Folks. Another group would go out at nighttime, right. So. Okay. How was it when you went out the first time at night? Uh, a little scary, you know, because you know where you're going. You just trust the guy or the veterans who to take you in the right place, you know. And uh, uh, the, this, the guy who runs it is usually a sergeant, and he's been there longer than anybody else. He more or less goes and tells you what to do and how to do it, and you just follow his orders, you know. Okay. And so let's say as you rotated through all these three operations mm -hmm. and stuff, what was it like being actually when you were in the village then? Well, if you're at night, you're sleeping during the daytime, what have you. And if you're, other time, if you're in the village during the daytime, you usually are at a bunker or uh, you talk with the people uh, or uh, the, the captain comes over and he talks to you, tell you what's going on in the area, uh, what's new or uh, who has been hit, uh, where the Viet Cong have been, stuff like that. And the lieutenant, that you had the captain, had the lieutenant over, over us and he would come and more or less say the same thing also. Okay. How about your ability to communicate back home with your family and stuff? Was that pretty good at mm -hmm. least? Because obviously it's before internet and stuff like that and right. everything was the old fashioned writing process. Right, everything was written and uh, you, have, you write a letter, you put it in an envelope and you write free across it. That was, ooh, you're getting me. Anyways, it would take seven days to get home and then they would be, and they would take seven days to get back. And so it was like a 14 day process. Okay. And then sometimes my mother would, would with like a care package of you know, okay. cooking something and bring that and they would send it. It would take longer than that. It would take longer than seven days to get that. But yeah, and then when you get it, it's like, ooh, it's Christmas. And then all your buddies come around, what do you got, what do you got? And you gotta share everything. So. Did you write back home frequently and did you receive letters frequently? I received, maybe my, maybe I wrote every other week home, what I think. Oh, okay. I didn't wanna write a whole bunch because I don't want her to yeah. to get too scared of what's going on and things like that because they were always watching the news, they were watching TV. Yeah. My dad bought a huge map of Vietnam and uh, I tell him where we were and he'd look on the map, see, oh, he's here today, or he's going over here, or he's going over here. And uh, uh, so I, I didn't want to tell him a whole bunch of what we did, but you know, some of the yeah. stuff that happened, I couldn't tell him. But, because uh, I believe, too, even when you wrote back home, there were censors, right, going over your stuff, what you wrote. That's what so they you said, but I've never, I've never... I've never, if it happened, they never told me. Okay, well you must have been writing good or stuff that wasn't crossing the line, I right. Well, I, when, when the really bad stuff happened, I told them I couldn't talk about it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and they never asked why, you know, so. 
Did you get anything that was really special or that you wanted to receive from home when you got the packages from your family? Well, you know, we lived in the village and I lived with this, this one house, it was a straw hut house, two rooms, and it was five kids and uh, a mother and father. And here we are taking half of their house, five okay. of us GIs, and you got to know the kids and stuff like that. And they were very nice. You talk, you know, broken English, they talk, you know, GI this, all that kind of stuff like that. But they were generally pretty nice. There were Viet Cong in there, which we found out later, but not in the family that I lived with. And the kids were young. And uh, I would talk to them about, you know, you know, the United States and stuff like that. And I, I, I told my mom, listen, I'm talking to them. They may or may not understand. Do this for me. Please send me the Viewmaster you, we have at home and the little, little uh, I, numerous little cards. So they sent me a Viewmaster. So I sat down and talked to the kids. And, they, and then I showed them this. And they looked up the light and they clicked it. And they, their jaws dropped. And they were my buddies from that day forward. Really? That's pretty good to know. Yeah. Um, when you were in the village, did you feel that, that, that did you feel uh, many from the villagers that were maybe really antagonistic toward you guys, that literally you're living in their homes, you're in a village for them? Did they, did they get a sense that the protection process that you were offering was ultimately helping them? Yes, overall they did. The men didn't say much, and the women were more vocal, you know, because they're, don't do this, don't do that, this is, this is my house and stuff like that, in Vietnamese terminology and, and what have you like that. The men were resigned that this is what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, after a while, they became pretty good, pretty, pretty laid back with us. I, they even have, uh, when they would have food, they would offer us some of their food. Uh, yeah. And when uh, they would make rice wine, they offered us some of their rice wine which I'm not a big drinker, and that stuff's like strong. A little sip, and I just couldn't take any more. But they were drinking it like it's, you know, like it's nothing. But uh, they would offer us their, some of their food, and uh, they made these big rice, everything was rice-based. Okay. They would take, they had big bins of rice, which they worked in the field, and then they sold. And the, the one big bin must have been around four foot wide, around four foot tall. And they would always scoop the rice out there and cook it, and sometimes they'd make it into a paste and then they would put it on this lattice and bake it in the sun. And that was their bread, it was like a wafer. Mm. They would give that to us and we'd eat it. So, oh, this is good, bland, no seasoning whatsoever. But uh, we had that. We had their, their fish, which was oily, and their rice wine and their, and their, uh, their rice bread. Just out of curiosity, did you share any of your own sea rations or whatever the combat food was that you had with them to see what their reaction would be? We always tried to do that. They would never eat it. Really? What they would do is they would take it and then they would send the kids to Duck Fo and sell it and use that money to bring back to their father or anything like that. So they didn't like eating our food. Even when uh, uh, we had uh, stuff left over, what have you, uh, we would, and they, would, they wouldn't eat it. So even while you were based in the village, was it mainly that you, were, that you were surviving off of sea rations and combat rations, or did you have the ability to cook up anything yourselves? Everything was, was sea rations. Sometimes Duck Fo would make... Uh, stew and they'd pin these big metal things that would bring them on the bus and they'd throw them off the bus and maybe once... Now this was the military bringing this? Yeah, the military, the army. And uh, I think maybe once once a week they would throw something off there and it'd be uh, drool, stew, okay. whatever, you know. But it wasn't very good, but uh, it was better than sea rations, but we ate uh, sea rations all the time. Okay. So wh how long, let's say, you know, you'd been there, what? maybe a couple weeks already, and all of this was unfolding in that mm -hmm. in the pacification process. Were you, were you going to be scheduled to stay in that one village the entire tour through your pacification program, or were you going to be moving around? They never told us, but we were there for eight months. I was there for eight months, and it was there a, a month before I got there. Okay. And uh, they never really told us, and, we, and the villagers always ask us, are you going to leave, what have you? I said, no, we're not going to leave until all VC are crocodile. Crocodile means kill. Okay. And... Uh, uh, the, the Captain Harris said, well, yeah, we're going to be this, and eventually you're going to train these people, and somewhere down the road we're going to leave, and they're going to take over, and they're going to defend their own village. Okay. He never said when. Did you have any sense that from the beginning when you started at the village until, let's say, that eight-month period ended, did you feel that there was significant progress, that the protection was working? To me, it was, Okay. Uh, I know people hated the Vietnam War and stuff like that, but in this particular program, okay, it felt good to see that the villagers could make their own, uh, uh, grow their own crops and keep all their own crops. We had a young boy, Dio, who was 11 years old, 12 years old. 
he would be perfect target for the VC to take to take VC. He stayed all the time, so that was nice to see that. Okay. Secondly, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the 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 family I had with actually took some uh, iron and some sea ration boxes and some tin, and they made like a little school out of that. Mm -hmm. So while they were there in a particular village, they had a they built a grammar school, a little school for the kids, and then Dia would teach, and then father would teach. And all the kids would come over there, maybe 10, 15 kids would come there. And it was like an education for them. They didn't have that before. Uh, if that was around, they'd probably have to go to Duck Bowl, which is 20 miles down the road, what have you. But uh, they felt secure enough to do this, to educate their village and stuff like that. So look, I thought that was a positive thing that we had. Okay, and was basically the protection that was around the entire village was just barbed wire strung around? It was barbed wire, and then we would have, uh, we would put Claymore mines, which are square rectangular little things with a thousand BBs and uh, explosive behind it and there'd be a wire and we'd click that and then the electricity would hit the sea floor, hit the, the BBs and anything that would shred within 30 feet of it, a thousand BBs would go at it. So we had barbed wire and we had Claymore mines in that. And then also we had like five bunkers built of sandbags all around there, which we would have to man during the day or man during the nighttime. And uh, we had starlight scopes, which uh, you can look through that thing and everything is green back then. And nowadays it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot better, but you had a starlight scope, so when there's no light at all, you could turn that and see if there's any movement out in the field around the village. Did you feel that you always had support from the back lines area if, if something were to happen? Well, we, we were attacked uh, four or five times, and <clears throat> when, they, when they really started hitting us really heavy, we would call on the radio for gunships from Duck Po, and within five minutes they would be over here. Oh, okay. And then the village would be here, and then the uh, VC of the NBA would come and try and shoot, you know, stuff like when they shot rockets, we knew we were, it was gonna be a, a battle, what have you. So we would call the gunships out of Duck Po, and they would come, and there'd be two of them. One was called Ace of Spades. The Vietnamese were very superstitious, and Ace of Spades they didn't like. Really? So that particular helicopter gunship put the Ace of Spades on it. So it would come from from Duck Fo, and we'd be shooting, what have you, and then the helicopter would come around, and he would just completely annihilate anything around their circle. Then he would leave, and the other guy who was up here came down, and he took his place. Okay, so they basically worked the perimeter right. for wherever it was, to pr obviously, so they wouldn't you know, protect you guys on the inside Correct. of the perimeter. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so for this time period now, the, the eight months and stuff like that, you're, you were just you know in the village, night patrols, daytime, all the stuff and everything like that, um, did you have any close calls? Oh, numerous, numerous close calls. Um, we had uh, the, the one that was the worst was December 26, 1969, and uh, we had went on a patrol, and there were five GIs and two popular forces, and uh, we were going to go on a, tro on a patrol way out, and we took around, I think it was a mile or two, and we were going across a river, and we heard some noise on the other side of the river, so we got behind a rice paddy dike, and we blew an ambush on them. And uh, we thought we did pretty darn good because there was a lot of firepower. We had element of surprise. Mm -hmm. and was, was this at night? Or? It was all at nighttime, nighttime, and it was cloudy, so we couldn't see anything. Okay, and then the clouds moved, and the moon came, and the moon was real bright. And all of a sudden, we saw what we what we blew the ambush on. It was a whole platoon of NBA, so we were really grossly outnumbered, what have you. But uh, anyways, they shot back at us, and then the guy next to me. Uh, was hit with a, uh, light, a law, a uh, rocket, and he got, it went through the dike and through him, what have you. And then everybody else, all of a sudden everybody's getting hit. Frank Garcia is over here, and I'm over here, and uh, uh, they, it exchanged a couple times. The person who got hit was our radio operator, so we had no way of calling for help. Okay. So that was kind of scary, you know. Here I am, a, a Northwest side kid who really hadn't had too many fights in his life, and here I'm fighting for my life. So anyways, uh, uh, after uh, a few minutes, they went, kind of got silent, and the captain, who was like five miles away in the compound, or two miles away in the compound, couldn't get a hold of us, Captain Boyd Harris, who was Gary's niece's brother-in-law, and anyways, he said, I can't, don't know where these guys are, I'm out to help them, we can't go out in the middle of nighttime, see where they are, mm -hmm. we really don't know where they are, we know in the general vicinity, but we don't do it, the other thing to do is shoot illumination. So they popped illumination all over the valley. And all of a sudden, the NVA saw the illumination being popped, and they thought 
maybe these guys to get a hold, hold of somebody and they're gonna get reinforcements, you know? Because they kept trying to come across the river, over here and over here, every time they come over there, you, you, know, you do what you have to do to stop them and stuff like that. Frank was on the left and I was on the right, and the other guys were, were kind of, we didn't gonna do much because they were, they were wounded. And anyways, after all the, the uh, illumination burnt out, uh, we just grabbed everybody and pulled everybody through the rice paddy bags into the jungle. And then, for some reason, the NVA never, they, could, they stopped trying to cross the river. So, lucky for us. So we stayed there all night, okay? And we just laid, put our Claymore, mount, our Claymore mines out, put all our ammunition in front of us in case we had to use it instead of going down here, you know? And uh, during the daytime, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, we looked over there, everything was gone. We saw one dead guy in the, in the water over there. So Frank says, there's no way for them to know where we are, who we are. So he says, you guys stay with the wounded guys and he's gonna go walk to the village. So he went all the way back to the village by himself. Okay. And then he called and all of a sudden, uh, maybe an hour later, helicopters coming all over the place. Helicopters, gunships, helicopters. Was this medivacs. still in the nighttime or is this early this in the morning? It was at six o'clock in the morning. Okay. He left at six, so this is around seven, 7.30. So all of a sudden, it's all, all, all over us and I see Frank come with the company over there. So that was you know, that was nice. So uh, Frank, uh, we got all the wounded on the helicopters. We searched for the guy's body next to mine, couldn't find it. He actually, the body was cut in two, and he went into the water. We didn't find it until two weeks later down the road. I had you. So the wounded were taken off. Frank and I went back with the with the, with the company with him, and we were debriefed by the Captain Harris back there. So okay. when nice. you went out on these patrols, how much gear, how much ammo, how much all kinds of stuff did you have to bring with? Well, usually you have, a, you have two or three bandoliers of M16 rifle, okay? You have one clip in there, and that's 30. Well, there's supposed to be 30 rounds to a clip. We never put 30 rounds in there because it would jam. Mm. So you were 27, 28 rounds. Like that. Anyways, then you have a bandolier here, a bandolier here, and a bandolier around your waist. Right? The M79 guy, and I carried M79 for a while, we'd have a vest of all the, M79 is a grenade launcher. And it, little grenades like this, would you would open the breech like a shotgun, and you'd shoot it, and it would, shoot a grenade a long, long ways away. You had a vest with all these different M79 uh, rounds on it, maybe 30, what have you. Uh, usually, uh, Frank Garcia was a big guy. Sometimes he would carry the M60 uh, machine gun, which was heavy, but it was real fast. Frank was a big guy, 6'3", 250, what have you. But uh, he would have to have uh, uh, a bandolier of extra that, and sometimes we'd have to carry a bandolier of that because he couldn't carry all the ammunition for that. So the M16 guys carried theirs, and you had grenades. You had to carry two or three grenades. Uh, you had to carry usually a flare, what have you, in case of, of problems. You had to carry smoke grenades. In case something happened, you had to pop a smoke grenade and throw it in there, and, it would, and then when the medevac would come over here, okay. they'd have to identify what smoke that is before they came down. Oh, so it's specific by color. Right, because sometimes we would throw the smoke grenade, all of a sudden, a smoke grenade way over there would be nuts. The DC would have a smoke grenade, you know. Oh. And then we'd have to tell the helicopter guys, no, our smoke is this. And they got the, the uh, smoke grenades through Americans? or was Somehow it they just... got smoke grenades either okay. through... Uh, so then they tried to do that to, to, to attract the helicopter to come right. by them and right. then do an ambush. Right. So we'd have to throw like another that. smoke grenade out there and then uh, that would more or less... And then the, the uh, helicopter would say, I'm not coming down until I get a gunship here. So the gunship would come over here and then when... That gunship came, then he came down, the medevac guy came down and got our guys. Wow. So what, how much weight do you think you wound up carrying on a normal? Now, a regular, with a rucksack, when you're walking, if, when you're walking, it's usually about 50 pounds, but we have to, sometimes if you're walking, it's up, up to 60 to 75 pounds, because you have to have your ammunition. Sometimes you have to have a mortar, because the mortar rounds, everybody has to carry a mortar round. One guy has to carry the mortar plate, which is real heavy, so a big, big guy would do that. Wow. But you'd always have to carry uh, your, your ammunition, ammunition for the M60 machine gunner, and sometimes a mortar round, okay. and uh, plus your hand grenades and stuff like that, so, and your food. And you know, you didn't, you had a, maybe a t-shirt, maybe socks, that's about all, you know. And if you needed uh, anything else, you know, tough luck, you don't get it. Yeah. Well, it seems like an immense amount of stuff that you had to carry. Well, I mean, it's obviously to save your life. And stuff everybody like did it, though. It's not, it's not, because I went special. I mean, super innocent. Everybody did the same thing. We didn't know any better. You know, everybody yeah. did the same thing. So. Wow. That sounds amazing. So it seems to me like, it, in a way, your description of this, it, at least I get a sense that your backs were covered when you were in trouble, and it seems like the helicopters and support came in. 
as uh, long as your radio man, as long as your radio yeah. was operating. Right? Wow. So, what what other experiences did you see? So you've been there for like say eight eight months. Um, you were coming near the end. Did you have any idea what the next things were going to be for you? Because your your time period in Vietnam was a year. Right. So eight months was almost done, let's say, at, at Duck Tho. Um, what was next in line for you there? Well, it, it, what you had is, uh, you, after that you went, it's called humping in the boonies. So you just, the helicopters come pick you up and they deposit you over here. And you walk around and look for stuff okay. and nothing happens, they come and pick you up and they put you over here. Yeah. And then uh, every couple, maybe two months, there was something called stand down they would pick you up and they'd bring you back to Duck Bowl for four days, or three or four days. And therefore you could uh, get, get a shower, drink some Coke or beer, what have you. Sometimes you had like a little show, a Filipino band would come and they'd play the okay. show. And then after that, you're supposed to recharge and they'd put you back over here and over there and over there. So, and was this, this activity you were doing now, the, the patrols out there in the open, was this in the Duck Bowl area or was this a whole other part of Vietnam that you were in? No, well Duck Bowl was, uh, Around, I think around 20 miles south of us, what okay. have you. And then Van Trung, we were more or less by ourselves. And then up here you would have uh, Chu Lai. So it was like you were in the middle, it was unfortunately it was probably the one of the poorest sections of all of Vietnam. Okay. And uh, there was no heat, no electricity, one well for the entire village. And everybody would kick that, and, you know, you dump it over and wash yourself, what have you. Uh, no bathrooms, you know, the GI, we had to make no bathrooms and cut it a uh, big uh, oil container in half, put two by fours over it, sit on that, and then you have to burn that, put, put the in, uh, fuel in there and then burn it, what have you. The Vietnamese, no big deal. They had water, they had to go to the bathroom, they go in the rice paddy nights. That's when they went to the bathroom, you know. Oh. And uh, what we had to do is uh, dig a hole in the ground, uh, put a mortar tube into the hole, put rocks in it, and that's where, that's where we urinate. Was, uh, so when you were doing this, I mean, you were basically then out in the open all the time. You didn't even have a village or a, a, a place to retreat back to. You were out in the open, and then you got picked up and just yeah. dropped off. But but you were usually there with like uh, a whole bunch of guys, maybe sixty guys. Like okay. Like so so it's a, it a larger amount of men that were out there doing this as opposed to how much you had in the village Correct. and stuff like right. that. Um, and was this again? morning, noon, and night operations you were doing, or was this mainly daytime operations? Daytime you would hump, nighttime somebody, one squad would go do a, a, a ambush over here, and maybe one squad would do an ambush over there. So the VC wouldn't come and get the big main area. But uh, that's, that's how it was when you, they called the humping the boonies. So uh, if you thought that there was some success coming from the pacification program part in the village, mm -hmm. what did you think about this aspect of it? You'd go there during the daytime, and then you'd come back here at nighttime. And then you would have that at nighttime. Oh, That's see. why the pacification was, was, in my opinion, working, because what you had, they couldn't get. But when you're humping the boonies, yeah. you're over here, you're not stationary here, you may find a village or, or a VC, what have you, and you take them and you put them back on a uh, helicopter, and then you go over here, and they'd come right back over there. It was their neighborhood, it was their country, you know? So. And another thing is when you catch somebody, uh, our instructions were, uh, if they have a pamphlet, called a Chu Hoi pamphlet, you can be in a terrible firefight, what have you, and then if it stopped, and they had this pamphlet, and they hold it up in the air, it's a Chu Hoi pamphlet, that means open arms, we'd have to stop what we're doing, and then we'd have to take them in. And then they would be sent on a helicopter, sent back to the rear, re-educated, and come back out in the field, and supposedly uh, help fight us, uh, help help us fight the Viet Cong, oh. or like that. Did you ever have ever ever have anyone actually surrender yeah, we, to you? In, like in, in our village, we had one Chu Hoi in the village. He was a Viet Cong in the in the neighborhood that was caught and actually been wounded. He went back, educated. They put him back in our neighborhood, <clears throat> back in our village, and uh, he helped us in the beginning. He helped us where the uh, booby traps were. He told us what trails not to go down, what have you. He was really, he was really good. And then he got he got hit one time, and then uh, and he got trapped up a booby trap, and then. That his old demeanor changed. He didn't want to go out anywhere. He didn't want to help us and stuff like that. But he was actually uh, given a clothes, given a monthly uh, 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 salary, and given bullets and stuff like that uh, to try and you know, come help the Americans and stuff like that. In the beginning, he was good. At the end, he was he was too scared of anything. Okay. 
How about friendship and camaraderie with your, your fellow soldiers there? It was, it was good because you were tight, because in combat you've got to rely on your friends, what have you. You've got to have your back. Uh, the only problem with Vietnam is there was a constant rotation of people. Okay. You could have come in with six guys, and then uh, some of the guys would get wounded, what have you, or they'd go in different squads and you never see them. Okay. Uh, it's not like everybody came in and everybody left together. There was a constant, you had 30 days or 60 days, you'd come and you get somebody brand new. I, the squad I was initially in, uh, I think we must have had like altogether like 22, 25 different people throughout the, the, the months I was there. Some guys got wounded, some guys got killed, and some guys uh, couldn't take it. And then they went back into the rear, what have you, like that. So you never really bonded. You bonded when there was uh, combat. Okay. Mm -hmm. After combat, I was in a I was in a squad with uh, five black guys. Okay, and they liked, liked me in there because I was at that time I was very good with the M79. You know, and uh, we were we were very close and very tight with him. Uh, and it was, I guess if I walk see them on the street today, say hey how you doing and stuff like that. But we were tight then. But mm -hmm. when they went to the rear, they drifted off into their friendships with him. Mm -hmm. All the years out the year I was there, I never. I saw a friend on Facebook, but I never saw anybody face to face that I was with. You know? uh, even the guy in my neighborhood, were, he was, he was, unfortunately, he was killed, what have you. But uh, all the other people, I've joined different organizations Vietnam, mm -hmm. VFW, and haven't found any of them. I found a couple on Facebook, a couple of my friends in New York, we've talked. But that's about it as far as face to face. Uh, well, hopefully, maybe even an interview like this when it'll be yeah, discovered yeah. through us or discovered through the Library of Congress that yeah. that may open up and stuff yeah. right there for you. Because I've, I've I've gone on, on websites and uh, I've uh, looked at people. I've looked at people on Facebook. I've looked at people on Google. And that and no luck so far. Only two two two, two guys in New York. Yeah. Did you get the opportunity to get a full-blown R&R where you could get away completely? And I know from what my understanding of, of that during the Vietnam process was, you, as the soldiers, you were able to actually get removed from the front lines, go off to some other countries. Did well, some you, guys, yeah, we got seven days R&R, okay? And some guys went to Hawaii to meet their wives. A guy by the name of Tom Ridge was one of the sergeants. He was a oh. uh, Pennsylvania mayor, and he also was our Homeland Security guy. He went home to see his, he went to Hawaii to see his wife, got appendicitis and never came back. Some guys went to Australia. Some guys went to uh, Bangkok, Thailand. Okay. I went to Hong Kong, because I've never been to Hong Kong, okay. and I saw pictures there. So you have seven days in Hong Kong. The first day, they're telling you about what to do, what not to do, what to be aware of, and stuff like that. And the other days, they send you out there. You gotta be back here at this time. So that's what we did. You know, you go out there and you drink and you, you party, what have you. But they also had the, uh, uh, I forget what it was called, but it was like a gift shop for GIs, and I bought tons of stuff and I sent it home because I bought three suits and sent them home. Oh, wow. my, tailor, my dad said, get some tailor-mades. I bought uh, Japanese kimonos from my mother and my sister and my grandson, and stuff, or my, or my nephew, what have you, like that. So I spent more time doing that than probably having, having fun. But uh, Now, when you went to, to Hong Kong, were you with... Uh, members of your same unit, or was this you went by yourself and others went by themselves? And went by yourself. Really? You went, you went back to Duck Fo. They put you on the plane. Who's going to Hong Kong? Put you on the plane going to Hong Kong, and uh, and that was it. You was by it. yourself. Yeah. Wow. And you had one chance to do that. Was that near the end of your one year? year? Once, a, once a year. Yeah. Right. Was that near the end of the time? No, that, that was. There? I think. I, I think I was there in July. What have you? Somewhere on there. So it was near the end. But uh, yeah, I always wanted to see another part of the world besides Vietnam. But and I, I know anything about Australia and Hawaii. I had nobody to Hawaii for, yeah. so I figured I'd go to Hong Kong because different part of the world. Okay. So now you come back, and you're. Is it the same process? You were sort of being used as bait, going out to these various open areas and right. trying to make contact. Well, you come. I came back to the village, and we stayed another month or so there. Okay. And then they said, okay, now we're going to leave. Uh, they feel that there's, they, they're, they're self, they could be self-sufficient, what have you. We are not going to be humping now for the next few months, what have you. So, and when you're done, when you're humping around, uh, it's like you do, you're relying on the MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They look and see where the problems are, where the potential NVA or VC are. And then they talk to the 
army and they say, okay, they're over here and they plan out a strategic move and how to blocking force, you go over here and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You rely on them to tell you where, where you gotta go. We have no idea where the, where the VC are. We knew where they were when we lived in the village. We knew what, what areas where the VC more or less were because when we were in the village, the VC were all around. At nighttime, they would come with the megahorn and they'd talk to the black guys. And as a black, you know, why are you black man making a white man's war and stuff like that? We could not shoot so, at them. So they were actually speaking this in English then, so everybody Broken understood English, it. yeah. Well, we couldn't shoot at them because they would, they would talk from another village and we couldn't shoot in the village, you know. Oh. So it was, uh, it was a strange. But when you're humping, and when you're walking in the boonies, they say like that, what have you, uh, and you're walking through this thick, thick elephant grass stuff, which will cut you like crazy, and one guy's got a machete and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. like saying, I know there's nothing here because if I, gotta, if I gotta cut a machete, you know, <laughs> they're not here. There's one thing that when you were humping though, you knew where the enemy was. It was called a, uh, some kind of a mosa plant. It's called the touch plant. Okay. It's a fern, and you touch it, and it shrivels up. And we would be walking, and we'd hit these, these ferns, and all of a sudden, this, 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 they would shrivel up. They said, they know exactly where we're going to be. Said, yeah, we oh. know exactly where they're going to be, too. But um, I, it's, I think what's called, some kind of mimosa, some kind of mimosa fern. I, look, I Googled it, and I found out what it was. But uh, anyways, it was a, uh, that was kind of a little scary when you're out there. But when you saw the leaves like that, so you, well, what it, coming. All, it also sounds the way you're describing it is just the thick vegetation, but also I assume the height of this was that you saw literally nothing in front of you? And many times, right, many times there was not, not much you could see. So, and that's why the first, the lead guy always had a machete. You know? But we were taking our orders from the guys from the rear saying, there should be something over here, so go in this area. And they were basing that direction on other information they got back from intelligence or Correct. something? Yeah. If they take prisoners, the prisoners would give them information, or a MACB would have snitches somewhere and stuff like that, but, and they would plan their, uh, uh, their our, our courses on that information. So at this point, are you getting near the end of your one year? Yeah, getting near the end of one year, and when you're like two or three weeks left, uh, they, they take you out of the field, and they put you at a fire base. Now, a fire base is just a big hill with, with, with uh, uh, artillery all over, what have you. And it's got razor wire all around it, what have you. And usually at the base, they, they put us at the base of the, of the, uh, the, the, the fire base okay. in case the VC come, what have you. Most times they can't because the fire base would just annihilate everybody. So when you get two weeks or three weeks, what have you, you call being, quote, short. Mm -hmm. And you'd be walking short, 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 you know trying to make everybody envious because you know you're going home. <laughs> and again, I think earlier on when we were conversing about this, everybody had their own time period when they was in. So it wasn't the entire unit going back, right. it was whoever was in this end of their one year period in it. Right. So did you go back with any people that you started with? Nope. Really? Nope. No, I went back with guys from, from I was a Bravo company, I went back with guys from Alpha company or uh, Delta company, what have you like that. Never, uh, never. Nobody, nobody from my company, nobody from my platoon, nobody from my squad went home with me. Even though when I went there, mm -hmm. I had like uh, I had Schneider and Gary Manchester, Robinson and Pena, but uh, they, they were long gone, what have you. So now you're at the fire base and that, and the days are coming shorter for you and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Were you going out on any kind of operations then, or were you pretty much they, they sort of just recognized the shortness of your stay left. And we, we stayed at the base. Okay. We stayed at the base there. And the only time we went out at nighttime when we got word from them that maybe there was some VC in the area, then we'd have to go out, but we wouldn't go out very far. And then we'd have to come back, you know, because, uh, no offense, but they wanted to, they, wanted, they don't want guys who are short to get, yeah. get killed and head like that, so. Because up there you had, you had, uh, they had infrared. They could tell who's walking around what have you like that and they could shoot illumination all over the valley and they could see people and stuff like that otherwise they had bigger starlight scopes and they could see something way over there you know that we can't see you know so but uh, yeah they more or less kept us at the base as a protection for them but it was pretty fairly, fairly safe fairly safe during this whole time were you still in sort of routine communication with your family back home letters being written on routine yeah miles? yeah more or less yeah because tell me hey, i'm coming home what have you i know a couple times some of my friends had left before me. And I said, hey, Hans is gonna leave. He's going to come and see you, what have you like that, because Hans and I went to high school together. 
We didn't know each other in high school, but we met over in Vietnam. And I told my parents, hey, Hans is coming home. Unfortunately, Hans, uh, three days before Hans was supposed to go home, he walked down the wrong path, hit a booby trap, and got killed. So I had to tell my parents, he's not gonna, he's not gonna come and see you. Okay. I, I told them that what happened when I got home, and I didn't tell them the letter, so. Okay. So how did you, how were you told that your time was up and stuff? Was it like another order, and you know, or you knew exactly the day that it was gonna happen? Well, you knew what it was, and they also gave you uh, a sheet of news, a sheet of paper, and it has 30 days on it, and you could put an X on 30 days. Okay. And uh, that was called a short timer's calendar, what have you. And they did that and wanted us to tell you, hey, here it is, you're getting short, pay attention, don't get careless, because so, so many people who got wounded and got killed because they got careless. Mm -hmm. And this is more, here's a short timer's thing, and check off every day, what have you, so you're closer to home, you're closer to home, what have you. Okay, so now the day comes. How's that work, that they finally leave? Well, they went to, they took, to, took me to Duck Foe and flew over to Cameron Bay, what have you. And they give you the little speech about don't go home and talk about this, don't, don't talk about that. And we were unfortunately in the area where their melee was. Okay. And they said, you don't know anything about this stuff. Well, you came here, the reports were out, you didn't talk to them then, don't talk to them now. You still have friends over here. Don't do anything that could embarrass you, your family, all your friends, what have you. And uh, when you go home, you're gonna be assigned to a fort. And from there, they'll make a decision. Uh, you can stay your three or four months there and then you can re-up and get $10,000, <laughs> or uh, you can just uh, stay at that particular fort and do whatever they tell you down there. And oh, then that's right, I did forget that, because when you were drafted, you were drafted for a two-year period? Two-year period. So one year of that was almost all in Vietnam, right. obviously, and that was early soon after being inducted. Right. So you did have time that you had to then fill in or something. Yeah, I, I, I think I had four months over at Fort Knox. And, uh, what it was, was the assignment there? It was a mechanized unit, and we were not mechanized. We were all infantrymen, but they put all the guys over there, and you had to go to the uh, motor pool, and they said, uh, well, what are we supposed to do? You just stand around and don't do nothing, and you gotta go and patrol over here. You can patrol the grounds over here. Well, what about us? Check the oil, and if the officer comes, pretend like it's checking the oil on the, on the, uh, on the tank. Wow. That was it. <laughs> okay, so let's just back up just a little bit. So, so the day came when you actually were leaving, you know, the patrol area and the and the, the base over there. What was it like? I mean, was the process that you got helicoptered out to some other back base and then ultimately went back to Cameron Bay? Yeah, How you, was that? Working? Well, you took a you took a uh, they took a, a jeep or a, a truck to Duck Foe, okay, and then from Duck Foe they sent you over to Cameron Bay, okay, and then. Uh, they gave you new clothes. They gave you new boots because so, you were pretty nasty, pretty nasty, what have you. And then they debriefed you on all this other kind of stuff. And they said, you'll be going home at this day at this time. So okay. it was maybe within, when you went to Cameron Bay, maybe it was in two or three days that you were gone. And then all of a sudden, uh, you'd, they'd take, uh, uh, a bus would take you and it would take you out to the, to the Air Force Base. And the Flying Tiger guy would come by here and PFCs would get off and all the other once we so got again, on, just like when I right, started. Basically, it was a mirror image. Yes, it when was. When you came in, you were coming in, but now you had the chance to be the one leaving when they were coming in. Correct, yeah. And uh, it was like, you know, I'm looking at them, and I'm saying, hey, this is deja vu, what have you. you know, I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me, and they have all crisp iron fatigues, shiny boots and stuff like that. Just like you did. Yeah. And did you like, guys have the chance to exchange any words with them, or? No. I had, nobody said nothing. Okay. And then we got on the plane, and then we were holding on like this, and then uh, the plane took off. And, and where did the plane, it was at Cameron Bay? Cameron Bay. Okay. And then we're holding on to the, to the, to the seats, and the plane takes off because there's so many fictitious rumors about planes getting shot out of the air and stuff like that. And we're, we're believing that stuff. And we're holding that, and all of a sudden it got up, and, and when it got to a certain thing, we all screamed and yelled. It was unbelievable. Wow. And then uh, we flew all the way back to Fort Lewis, Washington, and then uh, we got off there, and there were photographers up here. And as we got off the plane, they're taking pictures. And the guys are getting off the plane, kissing the ground. And I'm, I got a picture of me going like this to them, what have you. And it was a big relief. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so. so now you got back there. Now you were able to get back home at least for a while, right? right. Before you had to finish the service right. part. How was that? Uh, I got home. I, I took a flight from Fort Lewis, Washington, from the St. Louis Taylor Airport to Chicago. And uh, I think I get in at 12, 31 o'clock in the morning. O'Hare was dead, there's nobody there. There's some 
and there were some radicals who were, you know, some guys, long hippie guys with signs sleeping, what have you. And my sister. And, and do you think that they were there like that? That was it, just to harass returning veterans? I don't know. All I know is they looked pretty grungy and they had signs, you know. So I don't know if they were, if they take turns, what have you, like that. But anyways, because I still had my uniform on. And my mom and my dad and my sister and my uh, nephew were there. And then, uh, you know, you get the hug and stuff like that. And then I'm walking and my mom's. <laughs> she had to make sure I'm 100 percent, you know. So uh, I mean, this is a crazy question, but were you, in essence, recognizable by them, or had you just simply, you know, I would think being gone a year under con under the conditions that you were, that maybe you know you had changed in some fashion or something. No, not really. At that time, it was just more relation, you know, just you want to hug and kiss and stuff like that. And as far as uh, being haunted and stuff like that. I can't say I was. The only thing I have from Vietnam is survivor's guilt. Okay. Because other guys who I thought were bigger and stronger than me didn't make it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I deal with, I have you so. Okay. But uh, I've, come, I've come to peace with that. So how long were you able to stay home before you had to report back for your final I aspects think I think of a service? Week. Oh, just a week? Yeah. Wow. Then you had a fort, and I took another plane on a Midway to, uh, it was crazy, because I took a plane from Midway to Fort Knox, Kentucky, what happened, or to, to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was on the plane with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the play, uh, uh, oh, what, uh, hair. Oh, okay. And there was like five or six, and I said, and I didn't wear my uniform, I don't wear my uniform anymore, you know? And this is kind of cool, and all these, these kids are on this plane, what, they're coming from Chicago, the play from hair, they're gonna go in there, and, there. and it was kind of neat. And then, Hey, so that's part of that's part of the play for crying out loud, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was it was really kind of neat because uh, they had no idea who I was. They were very nice nice kids and stuff like that. But it was kind of another unique experience, you know. Okay. A military guy going with the hair over yeah. to uh, Fort Knox. So at Fort Knox, so was there more to come after Fort Knox until you finished your service, yeah, or did you, you finish you, through there? I finished through Fort Knox, and then uh, when you get at the end, they they give you a physical, and uh, they check everything out. Say, oh, you're okay. You could have a you have a broken leg and you just want to get out of there, you know? So, because, uh, you know, just... So now you're home for good. Now I'm home Did for you good. Get, I mean, were you staying at home then? Still? Yeah, I stayed, I stayed at home. And what was, how was the transition for you? No big transition. Uh, I know uh, guys in the neighborhood, hey, come on, let's go have a beer, you know, talk about war stories. I, we don't want to talk about war stories, you know? And my dad never asked, my mom never asked, my sister never asked, I never said nothing. So I wrote my memoirs maybe like, 15, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years later, what happened like that. Okay. But uh, I had no major problems. Uh, I got home, I went back to work for the company I worked for, and then I saved up some money and I got my GI Bill, went to Illinois, never wore my, my, my jacket or any kind of in, uh, army stuff to University of Illinois, because they were still- Now we say uh, Illinois, you mean University of Illinois? Yeah, University of Illinois, okay. Chicago Circle, okay. yeah. So uh, I uh, got the and GI- what year was this? I came back in 70, 72, I think it was. Because I graduated in '74. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, my because you had the two years at Wilbur Wright, and yeah. now you were just finishing two more years. Yeah. And, and it, what was the what was the degree you were getting? Criminal justice. Criminal justice. Oh, so, okay. And that's uh, I was okay as a student, but when I got into criminal justice, I was a very good student because I just didn't know what I wanted, you know. But uh, and uh, it was very nice the GI Bill because I couldn't afford that, and the GI Bill paid to go to college, paid for your books. It was great, you know. So. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, I'm glad, very happy that that still was in existence at that time that you were able yeah. to take advantage of it. Um, so then did the, uh, the, the degree that you get, that became your career after that? Well, or at, did you sort of get other things? Well, I, I had taken an exam for the Gurney Police Department and I passed it, you know? And at that time I was going with this, this girl who I was writing with all the time. And uh, she said, well, what are you gonna do? I said, I'll be a Gurney Police Officer, what have you, because really, I was 11 Bravo Infantry. They don't train you to do nothing after after military. If you were, um, uh, if you were a uh, military police, you could be a cop, what have you. But being 11 Bravo, yeah. you really aren't qualified to do a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> so I so said, I think I might be a, a gurney cop. And then the company I was with says, what are they going to pay you? And they said, this. And the company said, well, we'll give you $6,000 more. So I stayed with, with that with the company and with, with security with the uh, National Chief Supermarkets, what have you. Okay. And I stayed with them, and then when they were bought out, I continued a career in security and loss prevention with A&P Supermarkets, so I stayed there for 26 years as a director of loss prevention. And I used my criminology degree, and my criminal justice degree information in that for contacts, for this and that, so. Yeah. 
the friendships that you built from whoever still survived through you know uh, the Vietnam part that you were in, do you still have friendships with a lot of the people that you served with, or no, no, no. Uh, besides the two guys in New York, which I've I've talked to on Facebook, uh, no, I've. Uh, the friends that I have that have passed away, I visit their graves every so often. Hans Rezivac and Dale Mosden, what have you. <clears throat> um, uh, the friends I had in the Army uh, when they, in Fort Knox, I, they were all from Detroit and from Iowa and stuff like that. So there weren't any Chicago kids around there. Okay. And it wasn't like we were, uh, and as far as reunions, they don't have any reunions, not for where I was, you know. I think in the Navy they had reunions because my friends go to the reunion Navy because they were on a ship for two, two years or a year, what have you. But in, in the Army where I was, constant turnover. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that seems to be the clear thing, the difference between then and I think how maybe they do it differently today and stuff like that, where it may be an entire unit that goes in yep. and out. But you're right, during the whole time that you were there, if you got to know somebody, it was like they could be gone in a blink of an eye and stuff right. like that. And then a new person comes in. Yeah. So. Um, so, do, have you joined any like veterans organizations? Well, I belong to VFW. I went to VFW first when I was in Louisiana, and it was okay. But there were old guys, and all they wanted to do was drink and talk about World War II. Okay. Didn't so then I joined a group called Vietnam, oh. which was a Vietnam veterans organization. Initially, out of here, it was good at first. Uh, they got some bad publicity because they got some bad uh, people uh, trying to ask for money and stuff like that. But a lot of guys. Similar, shared some experiences in Vietnam, it was good. We had a national convention in New Orleans, I was a chapter secretary for the convention. It was pretty good. Uh, the chapter in New Orleans was good until it got almost like 75% biker gangs. You know? Really? And then all they wanted to do was talk about, we deserve to get some money. Forget about that stuff. You can't change history, you know? Do what we can now. Let's have our bingos. Let's get as much money as we can. Let's give that money to the v, to the veterans hospital for the guys for socks, for underwear and stuff like that. You know, let's do that. Well, no, we got no. Let's let's do that. So I kind of got burnt out after those guys started. We had nice camaraderie in the beginning, but at the end there, there too many guys were they were just complaining. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and since that time I've been up here. I have joined the VFW as a at large member, so I can go to any VFW hall I want to. I have a couple friends up here who were in the Navy, and I go to their Vietnam, at, at, to, their, uh, to their, their hall and stream, or what have you like that, okay. but uh, they were just guys in the neighborhood that I knew and grew up with. So. Okay, well that's good to know for that part. Um, we're gonna enter a place, or a phase of what the Library of Congress recommends here on what we call reflections. Um, how, how do you think the whole military thing, you know, experience changed your life? Well, it kind of like made you self-sufficient, kind of make you grow up, they can see the real world uh, instead of being at home and coddled by your mother and stuff like that. So I, I enjoyed that part. I didn't enjoy the uh, the part where there's there's fighting and wars and stuff like that. But I came out okay. Yeah. And what are some of the life lessons that you learned from this whole thing? Sounds like you know you've already explained a little bit of that. Yeah. Anything to add on that? No, be self-sufficient and always have a backup plan. Always uh, don't take chances. Uh, Protect yourself. Uh, friends come and go. Family's there forever. You know, just like in Vietnam, yeah. the friends I had there. But when I came home, the family's there. So, so what are your thoughts, just in general, in today's day and age, about war and our military in general? Well, you know, you're supposed to learn from the past, but uh, it didn't seem like we're doing a good job. You know, uh, you, when you're in a war, get in and get out. You know. The Vietnamese said, oh, we beat the Americans and stuff like that. They had monuments to, to all that kind of stuff. In reality, they, they didn't. They, the war could have been won in a year because the Vietnamese didn't have a navy, they didn't have an air force, what have you. But politicians got involved in all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, with Afghanistan, the Russians were there, didn't work out. We're there, didn't work out. I just don't want to see any young guys killed anymore needlessly. Yeah, I agree with you on that. So now that we're doing this recording here, Annette, what would you like to tell future generations who get a chance, whether it's a year from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, what would you like to tell them about you know, what, what the process was of the military and, and everything related to that and your experience with the military? There's nothing wrong with being in the military. Just go in the military, get a trade, get something that could be useful when you leave the military. 
Okay, uh, I had friends who went in there who were air traffic controllers. They came out and they worked over at O'Hare, you know. I went in as an 11 Bravo, an infantryman, not really qualified to do anything else here. But if you go into the military, whether it's Air Force, which you probably have more of a, a career in the Air Force, go into it, uh, you, you mature, uh, be self-sufficient, and get something that's useful, like a trade or something like that, yeah. and use that as a stepping stone yeah. when you get out of the service. Very good. I do have to ask sort of a, a backwards question because I, I wanted to ask it earlier, but I didn't. And I've been asking a lot of the veterans that I've been interviewing this. When you were out in Vietnam, did you have any like equivalent of good luck charms that you brought with or knew of, or did you have any superstitions? No superstitions, but my girlfriend, who ended up being my wife, gave me a cross before I left. Okay. It was a chain and a cross, and that's going to protect, and everything was fantastic. The night that uh, the worst thing happened in my life was December 26, 1969, when we went in that ambush and all my friends got, got shot and killed and stuff like that. I made it, I did not get wounded, neither did Frank, and I went like this to feel the cross, and at the, at the next following morning I couldn't find the cross. It was gone. And I looked around and it was down in the dirt, I picked it up. Really? It worked as magic. <laughs> and that was early on in your tour, right? Yeah, that was yeah, in December, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad. I mean, you're one of the first ones that has actually told me that there's that there's sort of a good luck charm. Did yeah. you have that the moment that you were in Vietnam? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then I sent it back to Denise, and then she got me a new chain and sent it back. And I put that thing on there. It's like it was like armor. <laughs> so it it worked. Something happened. Yeah. It worked. Um, we're going to probably be getting now to the conclusion part of our interview here. Since I've been doing all the questions and everything like that, is there anything that I haven't asked or anything that you would like to share about a topic or anything about your military service that we haven't covered? No. Uh, this, in, in the Vietnam War was a terrible war, and there's a lot of hatred and a lot of, uh, you know, the misinformation on that stuff, but there were some good things that came out of it, okay? At least where I was, what have you. Uh, was it lasting? No. But just remember that even though the, the, a lot of things happened in Vietnam, look at your labels on your shirts, Vietnam. Look at your Nike gym shoes, made in Vietnam. So something good came out of that. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, just, just uh, look at the military. The guys who are in the military, a lot of them are not making decisions. The higher-ups are making decisions. So don't blame the guys who are boots on the ground. That's all. Yeah. That sounds like a good tip over there. Um, what do you wish more people knew about veterans in general? Yeah, they're good guys. Uh, it's a noble profession if you if you make if you make a career out of it, what have you, uh, and uh, embrace them. Is there anything that people who aren't in the military can offer things to veterans that would be a nice help? Just support them during the parades. That's all. That's a. Speaking of that, I do have to ask you that, because you're in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and I know there was really not a welcoming kind of thing that was going on in Chicago until years after. And there was a parade. Did, are, were you aware of that? that there was I wasn't a, there. Okay. You, there was an actual parade that took place in Chicago to welcome back the Vietnam vets. I do remember that. Right. It, but it happened way too many years after the process. I know one of my favorite groups, Sticks, had Dennis DeYoung. He wrote a song on one of those things called The Wall. And that was kind of healing also. So I don't know if that was played at the parade or when it was, but stuff like that makes you feel good, you know, that there's support and there's uh, good things out of it. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Nope. I appreciate you giving me the time to explain all this stuff. All right. Well, then this is, this is going to conclude our interview. Uh, this concludes our interview of William Herod, U.S. Army, with the Veterans History Project. Thank you, Bill, for your participation in the Veterans History Project. It means a lot to us as individuals and to the nation as a whole that your story of your military service will live on for all future generations to reflect upon. Thank you so much for sharing with us your story of your military service. Thank you for your service. And it has been an honor and a privilege to be able to interview you. Thank you. Thank you very much.